Welcome back. For the past several lectures, we've been talking about aspects of argumentation strategy and tactics, being able to recognize and diagram both simple and complex arguments, case construction, stasis, attack and defense of arguments. There's one more major topic that I want to take up under this general heading, and that's the way that language and style work in argumentation. And this lecture is really built around a fairly obvious claim that has implications that are not quite so obvious. And that is that arguments are cast in language. The sorts of arguments that we have every day are not reducible to the symbols of mathematics or formal logic. All A is B, all B is C, if P then Q, and so on. And the language in which our arguments are cast is not simply a dressing or covering that we put onto the substance of the argument itself. It's very much bound up with the argument itself. And the way in which arguments are cast in language has some profound effects for understanding the nature of the argument. What's more, arguers make choices about language. Just as they make choices about case construction and attack and defense, and these choices serve as a strategic resource. As with other choices, they often make them unthinkingly, but we want to be systematic in our ability to understand and talk about them. So recognizing that we can't separate substance and language, or substance and style, that they're bound up together, let's look, if we can, at some of the ways in which language and style figure into argumentation. Let me begin with definitions. Uh, there's a dry subject, you might think, and yet definitions are a really important strategic resource for an arguer. Let's remind ourselves, first of all, of the different purposes that definitions serve. The most obvious one is to characterize common usage, to talk about how people ordinarily use a term, what they mean by it. And those are the definitions that we find in a dictionary. Sometimes definitions are used to make vague terms more precise. You may have noticed that in these lectures there have been a number of technical terms, hopefully not too many. But when I've introduced technical terms, I've done so in order to give us a precise meaning, a clear meaning or clear understanding for a concept that might otherwise be vague. And definitions are also used to invent or to characterize new usage. In the past 10 or 15 years, we've seen loads of examples of this related to information technology. Terms like boot up, surf the net, download, and Google as a verb, for example, are all terms that characterize usage that didn't exist prior to the personal computer age. So those are all purposes that definitions serve. But there's another purpose that is particularly important for the use of definitions in argumentation. And that is the persuasive definition, or a definition that conceals an argument within it. It's almost an invitation to have an argument. This is a form in which definitions are used to gain an argumentative advantage for one person or another. They alter the meaning of a term by associating that term with either positively valued terms or negatively valued terms in the hope that the positive or negative value will transfer from the other terms to the one for which we use the persuasive definition. That's the theory. Persuasive definition transfers emotional meaning from one term to another. Now, let's try to understand this theory a little bit more with a simple example. One of the things that I occasionally encounter as a college professor is I'll receive from a student a paper that has been found to be copied from another student or from a printed source or increasingly from the internet. It's been plagiarized. Now, what do I call the act that has taken place? Do I call it carelessness or sloppiness? These are terms that would suggest unintentional error. 
calling for a classic teachable moment in which I explain to the student how to be more careful, how to make sure that he or she uses sources that are his or her own. Certainly a mistake, but nothing malicious about it, nothing intended to deceive. But what if I call it fraud or theft of another person's ideas? Now I've put it in an entirely different context. I've suggested intent and motive and maliciousness. So in one case, I've defined this act as carelessness, and in another case, I've defined the act as fraud. And the definitions are persuasive because there are connotations bound up in those terms like carelessness or fraud. And obviously, it makes a difference in how I'm going to respond to this behavior based on what I think of the act and how I'm going to evaluate the student who was involved in it. In other words, these are not neutral or trivial choices of language to define the act one way or another. When we do this in an argument, our definitions affect the perception of the argument and of how to respond to the argument. There are many contemporary examples of just this kind of a use of persuasive definition. For example, the estate tax has been referred to by its opponents as the death tax. Now the connotations that are involved in calling it the death tax are pretty obvious. The suggestion that death should somehow be a taxable event, as if the tax were on the person who died rather than on the person that inherits this windfall estate, makes the tax objectionable and helps the cause for elimination of the tax. The Democrats in the Senate, who were concerned that the rules might be changed to eliminate filibusters on judicial candidates, referred to this rule change as the nuclear option. And of course the connotation of nuclear option is that this would just be a devastating blow to the civility and the procedures of the Senate almost like dropping a nuclear bomb. This would not be a minor change in the rules or a different way in counting up the votes. Or a particularly obvious example in the early years of the 21st century, a particular medical procedure that has the name intact dilation and extraction has been called by its opponents partial birth abortion. And of course, calling this procedure partial birth abortion is not neutral at all. It's a way to mobilize objection to this particular procedure uh, by suggesting that it is especially gruesome and inhumane. Now notice in all of these examples, the argument is cast in a particular language. The language is an attempt to define some key terms but the definition is not neutral. The definition affects the way in which the argument is perceived and is dealt with. Now, how are definitions used? One of the ways that they're used in argument is to widen or narrow the scope of the conflict. To widen or narrow what the dispute is about and consequently who might be in a position to have something to say about the dispute. And it happens in two ways. One, definitions can be used to widen the scope of argument. The person who stands to lose the argument if it's confined to a narrow scope may seek to widen the scope. For example, what happens if we refer to budget deficits as immoral? Once we enlarge the scope of the argument to refer not just to technical economics, but to morality, we have broadened the circle of people who have something legitimately to say about the argument. It's not just economists. It's not just a professional dispute. It's not just a technical matter. It's a matter that raises questions of principles and morals about which anybody is qualified to be involved or to have something to say. So if you stand to lose by having the argument be construed narrowly, 
you define it in such a way as to broaden the scope. It can also work the other way around. Definitions can be used to restrict the scope of argument by excluding otherwise interested parties. There's a famous speech in which President Kennedy said that the management of a modern economy is increasingly technical in nature. Well, this is an attempt to do the opposite of my first example, to say if it's technical in nature, then the people who are qualified to say something about it are those with technical expertise and training, not ordinary citizens. Or when in discussing missile defense, some advocates said the concept of throw weight and how it's measured is an increasingly technical kind of problem. It's to suggest, hey, for people who don't have this kind of technical training, stay out of the argument because you're not qualified to say anything about it. So definitions can be used to alter not only the connotations of a term, but the scope of the dispute of the controversy itself. Now, however they're used, as a general rule, definitions ought to be clear enough that they avoid some common errors in meaning. And I want to talk briefly about some of those errors, and it'll be pretty obvious why they're things we generally try to avoid. One of them is equivocation. Equivocation is the use of a term in two different senses in the same argument, so that the meaning subtly changes, and if we're not careful, we'll lose track of the original argument. So, for example, the parent who says to a teenager, I trust you, I have always trusted you, and therefore I trust you will be home by midnight. Well, the term trust means something different in that last statement. It means I expect you to be home by midnight. It's not referring to trusting one's judgment or placing one's trust in another person as it is in the beginning of the argument. My favorite example of equivocation, by the way, is an argument that's set up almost like a syllogism. It goes, I love you, therefore I am a lover. All the world loves a lover. You are all the world to me, therefore you love me. Now, you might want to try this and see if it has any benefit for you, but it should be pretty obvious that several of the terms change meaning during the course of that argument what love means, what a lover is, what all the world is, and so on. So that's equivocation. Second thing we want to avoid as we use definitions is ambiguity. Most of the time we want to avoid ambiguity. And that's a situation in which a word has multiple meanings and we can't tell from the argument which meaning is intended. Take the simple statement, the cardinals are in town. Do we mean birds? Do we mean a baseball team? Or do we mean officials of the Roman Catholic Church? We can't tell simply from the statement. It's ambiguous. A close cousin of ambiguity is amphiboly. Amphiboly. This is a less known term, but what it refers to is where a phrase, not a single word, but a phrase has multiple meanings. And you can't tell just from the statement which one is intended. My favorite example of this is something that I always threaten to do, but honest, I've never actually done it. I'm asked often to write letters of recommendation for students, and some of those I'm very happy to do. Some are much more difficult to write. And so I've thought about writing a letter of recommendation that says, I can't recommend this student highly enough. No one would be better for the position that you advertise. Now, think about it. Does that statement mean there are no superlatives that I could use that would capture the student? Or does it mean the student's not very good, I can't recommend them enough to be supporting them positively? You can't tell simply from the statement itself. That's amphiboly. So we have equivocation, ambiguity, amphiboly. Vagueness is another problem with definitions. And vagueness is a situation in which a term or concept is indeterminate.
as to what it means. There's no way to pin it down. I'm sometimes asked how old someone is. And I used to say, well, he's middle-aged. What does middle-aged mean? At one point in my life, I thought it was anybody over 25. And then as I've aged, why my understanding of middle-aged has changed proportionately. I now think 85 and up is a pretty good definition of middle-aged. But the point is, there's no way to pin it down. It's an inherently vague term. And as a general rule, we want to try to avoid vagueness. Then there are a pair of problems that are related. They're the mirror image of each other. And they go by the name the heap and the slippery slope. And they both involve using language that refers to making distinctions that it's hard to make precisely and so suggesting that they can't be made at all. So, for example, let's talk about the heap. If you're watching this on video, you can tell the color of my beard. If you're stuck with the audio version, I'll tell you that it's gray or white, depending on your point of view. But 35 years ago, when I grew it, it was very dark. Now, at some point, there was a gray hair. But that didn't change the overall color of my beard. We still referred to it as dark. Then there was another gray hair. One more hair didn't make a difference. Another one didn't make a difference. No one hair made any difference in the color of my beard. Therefore, how could the color have changed? That's the heap. Because we can't identify the point of change, we say there's no change. This, by the way, was an argument strategy that was used during the Vietnam War when with each escalation in the number of troops, there were official pronouncements that this is not a widening of the war or a change in our basic mission, but somehow as we got from 16,000 to 500,000 troops, it became an American war. That's the heap. And the slippery slope is just the opposite. It's setting off a chain of events that you assume can't ever be stopped a chain of consequences. And so I have students who come to me and say, please let me into your class because if I can't get into your class, I can't fulfill the requirements and then I can't have this major and if I don't have this major, I can't graduate and if I can't graduate, I'll have to turn down this job that's been offered to me and if I turn down this job, I'm going to seriously weaken my long-term income possibilities and if I weaken my income possibilities, it will hurt my mental health. And if I hurt my mental health, I'm be going to be more likely to be suicidal. So let me into your course or I will commit suicide. Now that's a slippery slope. It's a set of events that is alleged to be unstoppable and it leads to a result that is far-fetched from the point at which it starts off. This was also widely used in official U.S. government rhetoric during much of the Cold War under the heading of the domino theory. One of the sections I didn't talk about from the Kennedy-Nixon debates involved the islands of Kimoi and Matsu off the coast of mainland China. And the argument was that if they fell to the communists, Formosa would be next, and if Formosa fell, then Japan, and if Japan, then the Philippines, if the Philippines, then Thailand, if Thailand, then Malaya, and all of a sudden, from the loss of these islands that were the size of postage stamps, we would have communism uh, surging across the Pacific Ocean and threatening all of the world. That's the slippery slope. Now, all of these errors, equivocation, ambiguity, amphiboly, vagueness, heap, slippery slopes, they come about from the inexactness of language, which is a condition that's peculiar to informal argument. Language is messy. And you might think, therefore, that what we ought to do is we ought to make our language at least as precise as we can. And that's a good general rule. But not always. Sometimes imprecise language is desirable. Why is it that diplomatic statements are often rendered in ambiguous language to leave options open for later consideration? Why else might things be rendered ambiguously or imprecisely to allow parties with different interests to agree on something even though they have different reasons 
and different points of view. So, for example, the Congress of the United States passed a resolution apologizing for slavery prior to the Civil War. And the apology was fairly vague because some people believed that they were personally responsible and some didn't. Some believed that reparations should be paid and some didn't. Some believed that slavery was a continuing blight on our landscape. Some believed that we should get over it. But they could come together around fairly general language to express this statement of apology. So sometimes we want language to be less precise. And when that happens, there are ways to do it. One is the euphemism, a term that cloaks meaning in a fairly general kind of statement. If you study the history of the American Civil War, you'll know that in the years immediately after the war, different terms were used to refer to it. Sometimes it was called the War of Southern Rebellion, or conversely, the War of Northern Aggression, by people who wanted to rub raw the wounds. But for people who wanted to heal, it was sometimes called the War Between the States, or my favorite, the Late Unpleasantness. Now that's an imprecise term if ever there was one, and it's deliberately chosen in order to not reopen the controversy. Ambiguity, equivocation, vagueness, the very things I just talked about as errors, sometimes can be used deliberately to make language less precise. So for example, in the 1970s, when President Richard Nixon went to China, there was a communique that was issued in Shanghai that said, Everybody agrees that there is but one China, and Taiwan is part of China. Seemingly clear, and yet ambiguous. Did that mean that mainland China would eventually encompass Taiwan, or that the nationalist Chinese on Taiwan would eventually reconquer mainland China? Deliberately an unanswered question. On the other hand, most of the time we want to make language more precise, and we can do that sometimes by stipulative definitions. So a parent and child who disagree on what it means for the child to clean, clean up his room, the parent says, now by a clean room, I mean no clothes on the floor, all the things put away on the shelves, and so on. You stipulate the operations to be performed, and you thereby make the definition more precise. Drawing analogies to other arguments can make language more precise. So if we want to understand gender discrimination, we say this is just like racial discrimination that we presumably understand more clearly. Or we name or label the argument. President George H.W. Bush referred to the vision thing. And sometimes people who wanted to criticize him talked about the vision thing argument, referring to general goals or objectives. Okay, so we have definitions and we have precise or imprecise language. Figures of speech, which we think of if we studied them in English class as ornamentation, also have argumentative implications. They affect the way an argument is perceived. For example, consider some metaphors. During much of the Cold War, communism was talked about as a cancer. If we understand communism as cancer, it tells us what we ought to do. We ought to detect it early and remove it early before it gets to be uh, fatal. The war in Iraq has sometimes been discussed by its critics as a quagmire. And the metaphor of quagmire suggests we're sinking deeper and deeper in. And it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to extricate ourselves. In the last 30 years, all manner of political scandals have been referred to with the suffix gate, of course conjuring up the image of Watergate and suggesting here is an analogy, here is a comparison of scandals. And just a couple lectures ago, I said, think about how the military metaphor can mislead us when we talk about attack and defense of arguments. Figures of speech make a concept more salient. 
They bring it to the forefront of our consciousness. Other figures of speech suggest a choice, as, for example, antithesis. When President Kennedy talked about not a pledge but a request, I offer you not luxury but sacrifice. And metaphors can also be used to pose choices, like the cancer metaphor. Are we going to cut it out or are we going to let it grow until it kills us? Figures of speech also can increase a sense of communion between the arguer and the audience through references to common activities or experiences. So, for example, the quagmire metaphor in the case of Iraq, for most people over a certain age, evokes memories of Vietnam, for which the term quagmire was so often used. So just like definitions and precise language, figures of speech have argumentative implications. There's a very famous speech that illustrates a number of these ideas. It's a speech delivered by Abraham Lincoln when he accepted the nomination to run for the U.S. Senate against Stephen A. Douglas. It's the House Divided speech, in which Lincoln said a house divided against itself cannot stand. We often misunderstand this speech. Lincoln was not predicting the Civil War. What he was predicting was that the country would become all free or all slave and that it was moving in the direction of being all slave. Most people would think this a preposterous idea. The evidence for it was flimsy. But Lincoln effectively used language and style to support that argument. For instance, he, re he uses the metaphor of machinery to refer to an alleged plan to make slavery national. He says, let anyone who doubts carefully contemplate that now almost complete legal combination, piece of machinery, so to speak, compounded of the Nebraska Doctrine and the Dred Scott decision. To suggest that this is deliberate, he refers to the designers of this plan as its chief architects, and the executors of this plan as its chief bosses. Stephen A. Douglas's position, popular sovereignty, which Lincoln criticizes, he talks about as scaffolding. He says, under the Dred Scott decision, squatter sovereignty squatted out of existence, tumbled down like temporary scaffolding, like the mold at the foundry, served through one blast and fell back into loose sand. He uses the metaphor of building a house to refer to the unfolding of the plot. He can't prove the plot directly, so he argues it by metaphor. When we see a lot of framed timbers, he said, different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places and by different workmen, and we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, or if a single piece be lacking, we see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared yet to bring such a piece in. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first blow was struck. How does he prove there's a plot? He tells a story by metaphor and says, when you see these things happening, it's impossible not to believe it. And the metaphor suggests these things are happening. He uses accumulation of historical details to suggest the success of the plot so far. And he uses a metaphor to refer to Douglas, to forestall people from defecting and voting for Douglas. He says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Judge Douglas, if not a dead lion for this work, is a caged and toothless one, meaning you can't rely on Douglas if your goal is to stop the tendency toward nationwide slavery. Well, now I've covered this speech very briefly, but I hope you can see from these few examples how language becomes a resource in the argument, how it helps Lincoln to develop the position that he is trying to make.
Language and style are part of the substance of the argument, not separate from it. They affect the strategic positions and the interest of the arguers. And so our consideration of argument strategy and tactics needs to include a focus on language and style as well. Next time we'll start something new.